We are working our way through 1 Samuel, and we're in chapter 17, and tonight we'll look at verses 41 through 54. 1 Samuel 17, 41 through 54. Uh, a lot of sermons have been preached on David's victory over Goliath. Uh, a lot of people use a five-point outline to match the five stones that he used. Isn't that cute? Uh, there, there's one point for each smooth stone that David took from the brook and then put into his pouch. And usually these sermons list principles of behavior by which even the skittiest Christian can take down the largest spiritual enemy. David's victory, however, was anything but the triumph of an everyman, just a regular guy. David was not just another guy in Israel, but the one man whom God had specially anointed to lead and deliver his people, for which God had equipped him with the Holy Spirit as we studied back in chapter 16 and verse 13. And thus, when David said to the giant in verse 45, I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, he meant in part that he came as God's especially anointed deliverer. This reminds us that David's gospel, his message of salvation, was not simply the good news that those who trust in the Lord will be saved. His good news also said that those who trust in the Lord will be saved by the anointed one, the Messiah that God himself had promised. In this valley of Elah, this valley where, the, where this contest took place, uh, this anointed deliverer was none other than young David, and it was through his arm that God revealed his power in killing this giant Philistine. Now the message to Israel's army, therefore, was not made up of what each of them could have done. True, they should have defended God's honor, and they could have triumphed if they had acted in David's faith. The problem was that they lacked the Holy Spirit, whereas David had been filled with the Spirit at his anointing. In the reality of their weakness and sin, the message for the people of Israel was that they needed a Savior, which God provided by this man after his own heart. On the heels of David's victory, following his uh, disciples, we might say the Israelites then did rise up and they killed their enemies. David's victory points to our need of a champion as we face the greater enemies of sin and death. And for this, David typifies the true and great Messiah, God's son, Jesus Christ, of the house of David, and whose power we can join in the victory that he has won by God's grace. So after getting King Saul's blessing to go forth as Israel's champion, David took five small stones, and with his sling in hand, he approached the giant Goliath. And we read in verse 41, the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. This Philistine had been coming out twice a day for 40 days, challenging Israel to single one-on-one -on -one combat. So we might think that he was relieved that he finally saw someone coming out. But what he saw, this, this kid with a staff and a sling, Goliath was infuriated. He was infuriated with the greatest contempt. Like King Saul before him, Goliath looked only on the outward appearance, and he did not think about what was in David's heart. Verse 42 said, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and a fair countenance. So this battle-scarred Philistine wanted a warrior to fight with. Instead, he gets this little boy that he gets to annihilate. In addition, David's simple weapons insulted Goliath. We read in verse 43, And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And so the giant cursed David by his gods, 
promising to skewer him and leave his body as food for the scavengers. Verse 44, the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. We see in Goliath the literal fulfillment of Proverbs 16, 18, that says, Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Well, that's going to happen to him, as you all well know. David was not intimidated. Not only did he walk up to this menacing giant, but he gave one of the classic speeches of the Bible. It was one that rebuked the Philistine for his mocking and expressed David's confidence in the Lord's power to save. And so he announced his purpose in killing this Philistine giant. First, David rebuked the giant for his blasphemies against the true God. Verse 45, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defiled. defied. In short, David was pronouncing a sentence on Goliath for the capital crime of blasphemy. This day, verse 46 says at the beginning, this day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee. Now, Goliath might think that he could blaspheme the true God, but David had come on God's behalf, and he told him otherwise. Leviticus chapter 24 and verse 16 ordained the death penalty by stoning for blasphemy. And David had come to single-handedly enforce that law. And he came with stones nonetheless. Even more importantly, David expressed his confidence in the Lord to deliver him in this battle. Goliath had impressive weapons that we talked about last week. The, the, the Philistines gave him the best weapons possible, a sword, a spear, as a javelin. He had this breastplate and this helmet and all that stuff. But an Israelite who looked with the eyes of faith was not impressed with any of that. These were hardly weapons that could withstand the Lord his God. Disregarding all such mighty weapons, David expressed his full confidence Verse 45, in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. By referring to the Lord's name, David spoke of God's character as well as God's being. Now we understand David's idea when we think about the ironic blessing that the priests regularly invoked over Israel. That's found in Numbers 6, 24 through 25, and you've heard this before. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. When God first gave this blessing, he also said in verse 27 of that same chapter, and they shall put my name upon the children of Israel and I will bless them. To bear God's name, therefore, is to live under his blessing, which includes his promise to keep his people and keep them from their enemies. So in proclaiming the Lord's name, David was invoking God's promise to protect those who trust in him, a blessing that David considered to be a mighty weapon in the face of Goliath's mere bronze and iron weapons. As David saw it, Goliath was outnumbered, and he would soon be overpowered because the Lord would fight with David against this Philistine giant. David's words in verse 45, The Lord of hosts, the God of the army of Israel, recalls God's commandment of the legions of heaven and God's past demonstrations of power to overthrow his enemies. The God he's talking about had parted the Red Sea for the Israelites under Moses, swallowing a whole host of Pharaoh and their enemies. He's certainly able to overwhelm a single Philistine easy enough. David really thought these things through. 
David was so certain of victory over Goliath that he vowed to cut off the giant's head with the sword, even though the only sword available was on Goliath's hip. Verse 46, This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee. And like I said, the only sword there was Goliath. Now, in our battle with the greater powers of sin and death and other spiritual enemies, Christians are likewise to rely on the name of the Lord in place of worldly weapons. Paul described Christians as those who worship God in spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Philippians 3.3 3. No confidence in the flesh. This means that we have laid aside every worldly merit in claiming God's favor. Paul looked on his attitude before embracing Christ, and he recalled how he had once relied on the merit of his lineage, his covenant membership, his ritual performance of religion, and even his persecution of the first Christians. Looking at himself as kind of a spiritual Goliath, Paul repented, and he said in Philippians 3, 7-9, But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and he be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. So forget about my lineage, forget about all I've done, all this law-keeping stuff. It's all dumb. He had no confidence in the flesh. And David has no confidence in the flesh. And you and I are to have no confidence in the flesh. We're wired to be that way. We're born that way as sinners to have all the confidence in the flesh. The can-do spirit, you know, pulling ourselves up by our own bootstrap. All the things that worldly men admire. And we can't do that as Christians. Paul renounced all of the self-righteousness before God and instead trusted in the name of the Lord. And that is, in the promised salvation by grace that comes through faith in Christ. So David's statement of Israel's salvation to Goliath was matched in importance by the following statements which show his purpose and his goal in standing up to slay Goliath. David had a multitude of goals in defeating the giant, the first of which was evangelistic. David wanted the world to know about Israel's God. And so he says in verse 46, I will give the carcass of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth. Why? That all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. See, David had some good news. That's what the gospel is. He had some good news to spread. The famous God who had delivered Israel so many times in the past with such displays of power was still present with his people to deliver them from defeat. The further good news was that in the person of David, an anointed king had come who would beat or bear the name of the Lord against the enemies of God's people. The bad news for Goliath was that as the one who mocked and defied the Lord and the satanic, satanic enemy bent on Israel's destruction, he would be slaughtered and disgraced by the hand of this Lord's anointed. David. So the purpose of this gospel call was to summon the nations to cease their foolish violence against Israel and their defiance against Israel's God, lest they too would suffer God's just verdict of judgment and death that Goliath is about to experience. So the purpose of David's victory is not simply to save Israel or to defeat the Philistines, but to glorify God in the eyes of the world. That should be our goal. David's killing of Goliath was intended to have a message for Israel as well. Verse 47, And all this assembly, 
Talking about the Israelites shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. In, in spite of his youth, David understood his times. He knew that the people of Israel had wanted Saul to be king because they were trying to be like all the other nations with their worldly sources of salvation. Israel had wanted a king like all the nations because Israel itself wanted to be like all the other nations, at least when it came to salvation. The Israelites wanted to hold a sharp, sharp iron in their own hands. They wanted to see their own tall king standing before them and going forth into battle to have victory for them. And these idols had failed Israel miserably in the valley of Elah. As idols always fail God's people when they turn from salvation of the Lord and they start relying on other methods. The Lord wanted his people not to rely on having the best weapons, but on having the best of saviors. And likewise, he wants his churches today to succeed through humble, holy methods by which only he can be praised. Suppose the Lord would start blessing our church here, and people would start flocking here, which I believe if things get really, really bad in the world, they will. What are we going to attribute to that? Well, we have this great, wonderful, powerful pastor speaking. No, he's a one-eyed guy that can't even pronounce his P's and F's right. Or it's because of the wonderful music program we have. We have the greatest praise and worship band around, and our drummer is fantastic. That's why they're flocking to hear us. No, we can't brag about that. How about the wonderful programs that we have for all the children? And every year we put on a fair out in our, in our driveway out here. And people love our fair. And that gets them to come to our church. Is that what people are going to say? Nope. Nope. All they're going to be able to say is, over the years, all that church did was preach the word of God. That's all they did. But that's all they need. That's all they need. The fellowship of the word of God and true biblical worship. We can't, we can't praise anyone. And no one will able to praise God, uh, other, uh, praise anyone other than God, should he decide to bless us with numbers. Now the prophet Jeremiah would sum up one principle uh, that David wanted to demonstrate before the Israelites and to the nations. Jeremiah 9, verses 23 to 24. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. David wanted his nation to know that. You wanted a king, you wanted to fight battles, you want to be like other nations. No, we're not going to be like them. We're not going to be like them. And as I said last week, we're not going to be a church like them that can brag about their programs and their music and this and that. We're not going to do that. In this way, David was calling Israel away from trying to copy other nations, even as he called the nations away from their foolish defiance of the Jehovah God. Now, the battle itself between David and Goliath was so brief as to hardly be worth the price of admission. I've never done this, but I, on, on certain sports stations, they have what's called pay-for-view. And if they have a, a big boxing match coming up with two big-name boxers vying for the heavyweight championship of the world, you'll pay money to be able to see that on your TV. I've never done that. I don't think I ever will. But they do that, and people will pay you know, 10 bucks, 15 bucks, I don't know, to be able to watch these two awesome boxers go at it in the ring. And so they pay all that money, and if one boxer comes out, like Mike Tyson used to do, and knock somebody out within three seconds, you know, they wasted all that money. It's a three-second fight that you paid $15 to watch. Well, that would have been the case here if people had lined up and paid money to watch this thing. It was over before it started. 
with uh, David being lightly equipped, he moved very quickly toward the Philistines. And without further ado, verse 49 says, David put his hand in his bag, took thence a stone and slung it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. So however long it took for him to get this sling going, maybe two or three times, I don't know, I've never worked a sling like that. But he, he just swung it around, let the one end go, and the thing guided perfectly right into the only spot where it could have hit, and it killed him. David had a deadly weapon. After whirring the sling around his head, he released the loop, and he sent what I believe to be about a tennis ball-sized stone two or three inches in diameter at a speed ranging between 100 and 150 miles an hour at this Philistine. David's weapon may not have inspired fear, especially when he had all this armor on, but it certainly could wreak havoc, and it did. With the accuracy that came with lots of practice and a calm hand that was calmed by faith, David's stone flew toward Goliath, struck him in the forehead, blasted its way past that bronze helmet that the giant wore. The stone stunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. Now, the narrator's comment is as brief and direct as the battle itself. So, David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone, and smote the Philistine, and slew him, and there was no sword in the hand of David. A special note is the absence of any heavy weapons. There was no sword in the hand of David. Goliath was almost certainly dead before he hit the ground, but just in case, David jumped forward, drew the Philistine's own sword, and immediately hacked off the giant's head. Now, I imagine that was a pretty heavy sword. I imagine it was very sharp. And it probably only took one big swing. You know, with the memory coming down, and that quick, that head was severed. I'd like to spend a little more time on that, but I'm not going to. Just let you picture that in your head. So reading all this, we realize that Goliath really didn't have David out weapon because in this kind of fight, David's sling supplied this young man with an actual advantage. As long as David could make the shot, he should have killed this plotting giant. So it has often been when Christians have faced the weapons of this world. Believers sometimes shrink with the thought of, of being wrongfully arrested at the hands of a wicked government. But Christians under persecution have learned not to fear with such mere worldly weapons. This has been the case in recent experiences in the house churches in China, whose Christians think very little of facing arrest and imprisonment, happily pitting the power of prayer against the secular enemies of the Chinese government who are against preaching God's invincible word. And just recently, we're seeing in the brave Christians over in Afghanistan. Got up to go to church yesterday morning, about 11 o'clock last night, they would have gotten to go up to go to church. Many of them thinking, this is going to be our last day. But if this is going to be my last day, I'm going to spend it with God's people in God's church worshiping him. Amen. Forget about the Taliban. And they did that. And there's more for them to come. More, more uh, horror, horror stories we're going to hear as these brave Afghanis stand in the power of the Lord. Like the weapons of David in his battle against Goliath, the weapon that God has given his people are actually more powerful than the, than the weapons that are used by our unbelieving worldly foes. Even more important than the relative power of our weapons, those who trust in the Lord have the power of God on their side. It was actually God's hand that truly wielded David's sling and gave it the perfect accuracy that it needed. What matters isn't whether you have the best weapon, but whether you have the real God on your side. With this in mind, we see that David's victory was as unsurprising as he declared it to be inevitable. There was no doubt in his mind, no doubt whatsoever in his mind. And likewise, 
Christians who enter into spiritual battles, which we do every day, trusting the Lord, we are equipped with divine equipment. Paul described for us, and we've talked about this so many times, the whole armor of God in Ephesians 6.13 consisted of a belt of truth, a breastplate of righteousness, shoes made fleet by the gospel, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. These, along with the mighty resources of prayer, are our weapons. And maybe more important than the details is the overall impression we are protected by our salvation in Christ, with our head and chest strongly guarded as we wield faith to block arrows and the word of God to strike our enemies, held together with the truth and made agile like young David was with the good news of the gospel. We Christians thus armed, who know and trust the saving power of the Lord, not seeking worldly armor and weapons, are fully equipped for spiritual battle, and were able to see many victories by the power of God. So it was in the Valley of Elah, because when David displayed Goliath's severed head, the shocked Philistine army rose up and fled in a panic. The Israelites, suddenly energized by this triumph of their unlikely champion, also rose up and chased after the fleeing enemy, filling the path between Elah and the Philistine cities with empty bodies. Then they returned to plunder the enemy camp, as we see in verses 51 through 53. When the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. That's a poem, right? They saw their enemy champion dead, they fled. Anyway, and the men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until thou come to the valley and to the gates of Ekron, and the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way to Shearim, even unto Gath and unto Ekron. And the children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistines, and they spoiled their tents. That means whatever these fleeing Philistines left behind, they got to keep. And they probably had some really cool stuff. And it all belonged to the Israelites now. David curiously didn't involve himself in the pursuit with the other soldiers. In an action that has puzzled many commentators, verse 54 says, David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. Now we're so accustomed to the name Jerusalem that we may not realize that this fortress city at this time was not in Israel's hands. Israel didn't own Jerusalem. The Jebusites did. There, this was this lingering presence of this Canaanite fortress, and it was an embarrassment to Israel and a sign of the unfulfilled legacy of the original conquest of the Promised Land. They still hadn't completely conquered the Promised Land. The Jebusites were still in this fortress city of Jerusalem. David clearly recognized this, and so he took advantage of his victory over the giant to declare future triumphs that would follow in due time as Israel once more took up the mantle given by the Lord in earlier days. His declaration of coming destruction to the Canaanites in this fortress on Mount Zion served notice that Israel would be returning in faith to the Lord and that the Lord's destiny for Israel would be fulfilled. In other words, see this giant head? We're coming after you. We're coming after you. And just as easily as we kill the giant, we're going to kill you. That's why he left and took the head over to Jerusalem. There are at least two ways, two different ways, for us to draw conclusions from David's victory over the giant Goliath. The first and most important is to focus our faith on the anointed Savior that God has sent for us to, uh, to, to battle for us, the true champion, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Here are a series of comparisons by which we can better see Jesus through the lens of young David. First, we have a symbolic picture of the conquest of the Messiah and his churches. This arrogant disrespect 
of Goliath is the very spirit which the world opposes Christianity to this very day. The contempt that was shown to the lowly appearance of David, the undisguised scorn at the nation that such a boy could deliver his nation has its counterpart today in the feeling toward Christ and his gospel. They think we're nothing, we're worthless, we, we shouldn't even have a say, you Christians. And they're trying to push us to the side as being worthless. They held us in contempt. Second, the calmness of David, along with a complete reliance on God's faithful intervention, mirrors the demeanor of Jesus toward the spiritual enemies of his day as they nailed him to the cross. He went there calmly, knowing that that was his job to do. Third, the sword of Goliath was used against himself. The weapon by which he was to destroy his enemy was used by that very enemy to sever his head from his body. And this was a picture of Satan's weapons turned by Christ against Satan. Hebrews chapter 2, 14 and 15, thus says of Christ, through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, meaning Satan, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all in their lifetime subject to bondage. Satan brought death into the world, and now through Christ's death, he's defeating, using his own thing, death, to defeat Satan. In addition, we see a fourth and vital comparison that like David, Jesus weighed war against Satan, sin, and death as our representative. David didn't just fight for himself, but for the whole nation of God's people. And likewise, in Christ's triumph, his followers, uh, uh, his followers gained salvation received through faith alone. He fought for us. He won for us by his death on the cross. And he defeated sin, Satan, and death as our representative. Fifth is the salvation joy achieved by God's anointed Savior. The shout that came from the army of Israel and Judah when they saw the champion Philistine fall and the enemy fleeing in a panic, it foreshadows the joy of saved people when they realize that they are truly saved. They are joyful when they realize that the enemies that have been harassing them are scattered and fleeing. And that's why we come every Sunday to worship and to sing his praises. We are so thankful, Lord, for saving our soul, as the song goes. Thank you, Lord, for making us whole. And we've gathered on this Lord's Day to remind ourselves of that and to sing your praises. When we're doing that, I want you to remember from now on, you're in the army of Israel, and you're looking at this little kid, and he goes out, smack. And you see that giant fall. And then you see that little boy run up and whack his head off. And you go, yes! <laughs> yes! We're saved! And that's the attitude we need to have when we come every Sunday and worship. Yes, we're saved people. We have everlasting life. We have joy unspeakable, full of glory. We have an abundant life now. We have so much to worship for. So much to be joyful about. Same kind of joy they experience. Joy unspeakable, full of glory when our enemies are conquered and the loud voice is heard in heaven in Revelation 12, 10. Now has come salvation and strength for the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Oh, the Goliath Satan, He's down and his head's cut off by the power of Jesus Christ. So you see some comparisons there. Looking on David's victory in the Bible and knowing the victory it already achieved for us by the greater triumph on the cross of Christ, we can look to our future and final salvation with certainty and with joy. Knowing ourselves to be more than conquerors through him that loved us, 
as Romans 8, 37 says, we are all the more eager to follow Jesus, remaining as close to him as possible. At the same time, we need to realize that being joined to Christ in saving faith and having been sealed by the same Holy Spirit that filled young David, we are now anointed by God and equipped to fight his cause. Thus, we should live with the same confidence that made David so bold in his attack against the Philistine champion, saying to every foe and to every temptation, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. Through saving faith, the blessing of God now rests upon us. He has promised to keep us from all harm. David's victory calls for us to know the same power of God is available to us so that through this same faith, we can be strong against our enemies. Meanwhile, David's stated purpose in fighting Goliath gives us a noble purpose for fighting our own battles of faith that God might be glorified among the nations. We say it so often, whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, we do it for the glory of God. We want God's name to be glorified among the nations and that God's own people would be strengthened in their faith. David wanted that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel in verse 46. And likewise, we should seek that through our holy lives, through our joy in the middle of our trials, through our love among believers and loyalty to the truth, the world may know the cross of Christ is not just some relic of history. We should endeavor to prove to our neighbors and other onlookers that the Christian faith continues to give life, that the spiritual power uh, unleashed in the early churches continues to win converts today and that David's spirit of conquering faith still lives among God's people. Most of all, we want for many to see that all of this is true because the Lord of hosts is truly in our midst, that there is a God in our churches and that we have a living Savior, Jesus Christ. We know and trust that his death has won forgiveness and who in undying life continues to reign from heaven. Let this be our goal and we can go forth into every battle confident in the power of the name of the Lord of hosts, just like David was. In addition, let's try to embolden many disheartened Christians, showing that even in our weakness, the Lord remains mighty to save. Instead of fretting over our own well-being, knowing that our eternal security is secured in Christ, let's try to strengthen the faith of other believers. Let's try to make known to other Christian churches that the word of God remains mighty to convert the lost, build up the saints, and to guide the churches. We don't need some consultant to come in and tell us some worldly method of building our churches. We don't need those weapons. We have the sword of the word of God. And that's all we need. The word of God is sufficient. It's the final authority in faith and practice. As it is, we don't need anything else. And we need to let other Christians know that. That's where our strength lies. Let each of us, through the battles that God places before us as individuals, encourage one another. And let's together raise the tall banner under which so many believers have stood before us. They know, and we know, that this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. 1 John 5, 4. Let's pray. Father, Christians today and churches today need to be far more bolder than we are. We've got to stop looking to the world for the answers and looking to the weapons of the world to fight our battles. All we need is the word of God and the backing of our true champion, Jesus Christ, behind that, using his word as a sharp two-edged sword, a mighty sword, a powerful sword. 
and we want to wield this sword as weaklings, as little boys wielding the sword of Goliath and killing the enemy and defeating the foes of God and encouraging all of the modern day Israelites, all of God's people today, knowing that we worship a true God, an almighty God, a powerful God, and we serve a savior who's mighty to save to the uttermost. And he saved us and we lift our hands in praise and adoration and in joy to this great salvation that is ours through Christ Jesus. We've tried to worship him today, Father. We know it delights you to honor your son and we tried to do that. And we trust that you're pleased with our worship today and that you'll bless us and that you'll keep us as we go out into this hostile world to fight battles in our weakness, but in your strength. Increase our strength as you increase our faith. Increase our confidence in the word of God. And we pray these things, all these things in Christ's name. Amen.